Hi, my name is Derek Cavanaugh with the Green Lake County Land Conservation Department. I've been working on lakeshore and stream restoration for the past, what, 19 years. And our stream restoration program really got kick-started probably 10 to 12 years ago when we hired a summer intern to walk all 27 miles of streams that flowed into Big Green Lake and we set up a program where he documented and photographed uh, at various in or at intervals all along the stream. So we we're able to go back and look at some of those records and prioritize our restoration program. What you see here is a pretty standard bank that we found early on. Some of these banks were between three and eight feet tall vertical and consisting pretty much all of topsoil that had been washed down from the upper watershed down into these uh, valley areas where the streams are. So this is a pretty um, common view that we'd see. Uh, you can see the stream is really uh, kind of trapped in this deep eroded stream corridor, that's what we call entrenchment, that the stream basically cuts down into the uh, sediment and it cannot get out of the banks when the uh, high water comes and the floods occur, which is a crucial aspect of stream life and stream evolution. So this here is kind of a diagram of what we're seeing. So here's kind of the pre-settlement area where we have this uh, the groundwater near the surface. We're having a lot of wetland vegetation that's filtering out uh, runoff from the uplands and our stream is not that deeply entrenched. It can get out and flood into these floodplain areas, kind of rejuvenating them during high water. Over the years, all this soil from the upland has washed down and settled in the stream valleys in what we call cultural settlement. And you start seeing these high banks and more entrench entrenchment. You may see a little bit of meander belt, a widening at the floodplain, but typically we're seeing it's almost straight up and down. So these streams cannot get out of the channel. So what the ultimate goal is to kind of remove that cultural sediment, um, tip these banks back so they're more stable. And we'll kind of go through some of the process for that. So here's another diagram kind of showing how these streams evolve. So you can see with a natural stream, here's a natural floodplain, which is called bank full. Um, so during high water in the spring or during rain events, the stream comes out, leaves the channel and enters the watershed or the floodplain area. This is that incision that I mentioned earlier. Basically, it's cutting down into that sediment and getting deeper. So now it's trapped in this narrow channel. And then what? after a while, what happens, these banks get so high and so vertical that these banks start sloughing off and breaking off um, peds of soil, which carry both sediment and nutrients downstream. Um, eventually, over decades and maybe centuries, these streams would naturally stabilize. They'd keep collapsing uh, over and over during different storm events until it actually reformed that same floodplain area that it had before. Because the stream has so much energy built up in the water flow that it needs these stable conditions for, for it to operate properly. So here's some of those uh, banks that are sloughing, as you can see the chunks of soil falling off. What you're seeing here is actually a clay parent material or the natural uh, bottom to the stream. 
So we typically only see maybe eight to 10 inches, maybe less uh, topsoil over that uh, parent material, but we more often see it in feet. I just kind of want to talk a little bit about channel roughness and channel roughness depends on how fast water can move through. So if you imagine water running through some really tall thick grass or some other obstructions it's going to move slower than it does through say a uh, culvert or a plastic pipe. So uh, just a little bit on uh, why we're doing this with stream energy. I'm just going to grab a pen here. So velocity here and discharge, we'll work with discharge. It's the amount of water that comes out of a stream. Now that's impacted by velocity or speed of the water and the cross-sectional area. So when you have a channel that is incised or deeply cut down. Let's just say the stream looks like this here and just for easy mathematics um, and these are pretty typical numbers we see. Let's say the stream is four feet wide and four feet high during bank full. So we got 16 square feet of area for that water to move through. So that's your cross-sectional area. So now if we were to take this stream, this is what we've been doing, is grading these banks back, flattening them out, and actually creating a floodplain at the top where it's flatter. Um, these areas here, these are about three to one typically, so four feet. We're adding about 24 square feet on both sides. So between these two sides together, we have an additional 48 square feet of cross-sectional area. So we're actually creating about four times as much cross-sectional area. So now that's doing two things. It, not only is it increasing this cross-sectional area, it's decreasing our velocity also because now we have vegetation growing on these banks. It's actually causing drag. So it's actually slowing the water down. It has roots there to hold the soil and it can hold more water during flood events. <laughs> so we're basically handling uh, multiple components of the stream at one time. I'll kind of show you some examples of how we did that, but this is the the kind of the science and the calculations behind um, stream restoration with the bank shape. So this here is a, a recent project. This is one of the streams that was not incised that deeply. We're only incised about three feet. Um, but this is one of our lower priority ones that just got done this last winter. Um, they're all important, but we try to get the ones that are most actively eroding and most deeply incised done first. So here's an example from spring runoff. You can see um, all this sand material that's accumulating here, which is completely normal. You want the stream to come out of the banks and up into the floodplain and deposit material. But this is just an example of how much material a stream can move. And we're just seeing the sand here, which is the largest, the largest soil particle of the three. There's sand, silt, and clay. So if sand is settling out, uh, the silt and clay is continuing on downstream to the lake. So here's an example of uh, a stream bottom. This stream isn't too bad for clarity, but um, it could be clear. We can see the, the cobble size and the small stones on the bottom. You can kind of tell how much velocity a stream has by what the bottom is made out of. Is it muck? Is it sand? Is it small stones? Is it 
boulders that are two feet across. That's going to be determined by the speed of the water coming through. And here you can see this uh, same stream during a rain event where we're getting a lot of that uh, sediment mobilizing and clouding up the water. And this is something that we see pretty commonly. A lot of that sediment will move into the stream, breaking off from the banks and the peds, and kind of coats the whole bottom. And that'll sit there for a number of months until we get a big rainstorm. It'll clean all the sediment out at one time, uh, moving it all down into the lake along with the nutrients. So this is kind of that flush effect that you might have heard about where we talk about. Uh, we get most of our nutrients coming into the lake in a small handful or maybe one or two large storms throughout the year. Um, the other thing that we see quite a bit of is um, all this undergrowth here in these woods uh, is usually invasive species with uh, very little root structure. So a lot of annuals that aren't holding that soil in there like native plants would. So this is here kind of the process. On some of our streams, we do have to do a lot of tree removal. We try to minimize it, but in this case here, the erosion was so significant, this stream was incised or cut down about seven feet. Uh, so we had to do a lot of grading. That meant removing most of the trees along this section of the corridor. And you can see, you know, way back here is a backhoe. So this is a pretty um, good sized section, probably uh, 1,500 feet or so, and we've done restorations up to 8,000 feet at a time. So this is one from this last winter, one of the smaller um, inside streams. You can see this height here is probably only about three feet, but we are taking this outside corner down, laying this back to give that cross section a lot more room during storm events. And this is that site with the trees earlier, but uh, after we cut those banks back, uh, we put in uh, grass seeds and erosion matting is installed. A lot of these projects happen in the fall just because it's the driest time of year typically for us to be able to work near these streams. And these center sections here, when they are really um, sharp turns like this here, like these hairpin turns, these will be lowered down enough where the water can actually flow over the top of them during a rain event um, and try to reduce that stress on these outside bends. So here's that prior one that we were working on. Um, both banks are done now. You can see we're working in the winter time. This was done in January of this year. Um, so we got the erosion matting in there. And this is uh, a different site, but this is one year after installation, so a restoration. So this again was one of those banks that they came off here, you know, here's the top of the bank. So it was a good seven or eight feet in some of these areas. This is actually one of the first pictures you saw where the invasive species were in there. Um, it held up very well through uh, the spring runoff. And now this one's been done for over a decade and it's looking really good. This is just an aerial picture of one of our larger restorations where we did a little over a mile of restoration. You can see all the dots down here. Those are people doing a uh, 1,000 tree planting on this. And here's some of those people that all came out to volunteer and put trees to restore this riparian. Offer. 
And this is that same project. Uh, shortly after we finished installation, there's no grass growing yet because we installed this in the fall. This is a January uh, rain event, and you can see the bank. You know, the water's almost up the top of these banks, and not it did not cause any erosion even without grass in there. This is that same site now, so we removed some trees, we tipped some of these banks back, lowered these points. You can see these, these are tree tubes in here, so we restored some of those trees. And this is a confluence of uh, two different streams. So this here is uh, part of what would be Upper Hill Creek, or technically an unnamed creek, but it's referred to as Upper Hill. And then this is a tributary that's coming from the south and then this flows down into Big Twin Lake just a short ways down. And it's that same stream you can kind of see the uh, morphology here. We've got some rock riffles in here. Um, you can tell as it's coming around this corner and spilling over the top here it's actually dumping some stone in that part of the stream. So streams change throughout each segment. Um, we try to modify the design as we move through each segment. And this is just kind of a higher aerial of that same uh, stream. So that's the last of my slides. Um, hopefully you guys got a good overview of the physical restoration portion of our stream uh, projects. We also do do some habitat restoration work, but uh, we can cover that at another time.